Well, good morning, everybody. Welcome back to another session. And this morning, it's very exciting because we have Dr. Tammy Kim with us, who, of course, is no stranger to teaching in this format. But we're excited because we continue the theme of developing disciples. And we've had some really great topics that we've discussed. And so today, she's going to continue on that topic of developing disciples, and but particularly with this idea of knowing your Bible. So she's prepared something really great for us. So without any more delay, Tammy, come on up and, and teach us this morning. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Donna. Um, so, yes, yeah, so we're continuing our series of developing disciples. Um, this one's Are You Ready to Make God's Word Central in Your Life? Um, and so really the focus is on knowing your Bible. Um, so as you know, we've been following the Great Commission, which is here up on the slide, and our mission statement of to be and make disciples. So we're continuing on with that theme today. Um, I'm not going to get into the basics of read your Bible. I think you know about that, <laughs> right? But just some tips that as you're reading the Bible, um, just some tips for really getting to know this amazing resource that we have. And I was looking for a way to tie it into Matthew. Um, so as we go through these Bible tips, um, just want to work our way through Matthew's genealogy. Uh, does anybody else like me get excited about genealogy? <laughs> <laughs> you do? But are you as excited as 200 pages of documented history of your family back to Sweden and England? Wow. <laughs> so I worked with my mom. This was a great time just to go back, find all those brown photos of, of the genealogy. Where did we come from? Who are these people? What are their stories? Um, so it's really just amazing to, to dig into that. And so a lot of times when I read my Bible, I kind of, I do, even though I love genealogy, I do kind of sometimes just, oh, the bunch of names, I'm just going to skip over that. <laughs> you know, like, what am I going to get out of reading the genealogy? So this time, though, I thought, let's pause and look at this amazing list of names here. Because look at right in verse 1, it says, this is the genealogy of Jesus the Messiah, the son of David, the son of Abraham. That's verse 1. That's pretty powerful if you think uh, Matthew's audience are the Jews. And he's making this very bold claim um, that Jesus is the Messiah. And then through this list, he's going to go ahead and show that connection back to Abraham. Has anybody traced their genealogy back to Abraham? <laughs> anybody famous? <laughs> yeah, maybe? Astronomer Royal in Really? Nice. <laughs> I don't think there was anybody famous I found. Just farmers, humble people. So his genealogy in Matthew is broken down into three main sections, and you can see it here in three paragraphs, and that's how we'll break it down for today. Um, but we have from Abraham to David, David to the exile, and from the exile to Christ. So there's these list of names that we want to dive into. So certainly Matthew audience was the Jews. He wants to show how those Old Testament prophecies are fulfilled in Jesus. And so the Jews who might have been reading this passage, they saw this list and they were like, oh, I know that. Oh, yeah, I know their story. Uh -huh. Yep, they knew these names. They knew where they came from. Um, and so they knew this. And so I want us to have that same common background as we come into Matthew. And I think another thing that uh, Matthew's doing here is also showing that the New Testament is the continuing story from the Old Testament. So we have this bridge from the Old Testament to the New Testament. We have all these Old Testament names, and then we end with Jesus. And Jesus is now the continuing story. And that's what we want to look at today. So here are my big promises of what you'll get out of the session today. So certainly want to see the Bible as one continuous story. And we'll do that by unpacking Matthew's genealogy and put that into a framework that we can actually see God's plan throughout the Old Testament and that continuing story in the New Testament. And understand how this big picture framework can really help us to know our Bible, narrow in maybe on some key verses that we want to remember. And then we want to leverage this knowledge. So we take in this knowledge and we want to do something with it as we seek to go and make disciples. And just having that word handy um, when we talk to people. I remember talking to my sister-in-law and she was just boom, 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 like hitting me with stuff. And I'm like, I got to have this stuff up here in my brain ready to go, you know, to, to defend your faith and why you believe what you believe. 
And there's a bonus benefit. This is everything you're going to need to rock the Bible category in Jeopardy. These are all the key things you need to do. And I don't know if you do watch Jeopardy, but I was watching it back in June. I don't know if you saw this one. There was a $200 question. It said, Our Father, which art in heaven, this be your name. Okay, go. <laughs> you know what happened? Silence. None of the three contestants knew that it was Hallowed Be Thy Name. I'm like, how can they? This is like the easiest question on earth. I was just completely baffled. And it really just showed me that the Bible is becoming less and less important to our world. And it's really our responsibility as Christians to keep the word of God alive. And it's just amazing how it has been passed down, you know, first as an oral tradition and now written. And so it's our tradition, our responsibility to keep that tradition going so that we can use it in our own lifetimes and pass it on to the next generation. So how do we get to know this Bible? It is a continuous story, but sometimes it doesn't quite feel that way. Um, it is written um, by many different authors, over 66 books, over many centuries. Um, and so sometimes it can feel a little bit of a jumble, that things are kind of bouncing around a little. So you're kind of like, oh, where do I start? How do I piece it all together? How do I make sense of it as one, one big picture? So I think <laughs> most of you know we've got the major sections, Old Testament and New Testament. So when you look for some of those guides to the Bible to help make sense of it as one big book overall, um, you may have seen something like this that treats it like you're at the library and you have all your books on the shelf. You've got all 66. And so in the Old Testament, we've got the law, we've got history, we've got poetry, major and minor prophets. And then New Testament, we have our gospels, uh, Christian history in the book of Acts. We have Paul's epistles and then the general epistles. So very academic approach, um, but not overly compelling when you think about the amazing story of the Bible. And how many of you have read the Bible all the way through? How many times have you done it? <laughs> Once. It is kind of overwhelming. You really can just do it one time. Um, and so, um, so I've done it probably one time. And then I think I've made multiple attempts to do it again. It's just not been very perseverant there. Have you at least done the Matthew challenge that Donna issued? I, did, I finally did it, Donna. <laughs> like, I better do it before I do my talk. <laughs> Um, so this is one guide you could use, but it's a, a little bit academic um, and maybe not as compelling. So I kept looking. Are there any other guides out there? Um, here's another one. Um, still feels a little bit like history class, but you can start to see kind of a story emerge about the Bible. Um, it starts off pretty easy. It starts off in timeline order. Everything goes along. It's easy to make those connections. But the further you go down, it starts to be kind of hopping across books to see that different story. So you have all this information that you hear from sermons and devotions and Bible study. It goes in this brain. And for me, when I have a ton of information, I just needed a framework. I need to piece that into some framework to help me just pull it together. So I've been searching and searching and searching. So this has been my passion for like the last 10 years. Like what's like the best Bible framework out there to help me really pull it together? And so I think I found it after 10 years. <laughs> Although I just found another one on the wall. I didn't realize what casket was. I'm like, oh my gosh, there's another one. <laughs> um, so it really started as me looking for that continuous story. Um, and really to appreciate the Bible as a story, not like it's fiction or a fairy tale, but just how do you see the Bible as a story versus this academic you know, resource that we might have. Um, growing up, I always loved to tell the story, the hem. Um, so we should be excited to read our Bible. Sometimes it's like, oh, i got to do daily devotions. i got to fit that in somewhere. But it should be something that we, we love to do, and we want to get to know it and want to share it with others. And what you put in the brain stays there, right? Um, and there's a, your Holy Spirit, Spirit is this librarian. And if you've got this all cataloged just right, the Holy Spirit's going to go in, grab the right verse at the right moment just when you need it. Um, and it'll, he'll bring that to the forefront so you'll have it just in time. So this framework has been helping me, you know, organize myself so that I can have that handy. So just share a little bit of my passion for the continuous story. I don't know how long you've been here, but when I went back to teach LTA, 
uh, we use this curriculum, and it would start off with this video every week, and it would say, the Bible isn't just a book of random stories. It's 66 different books that come together to tell one story, an incredible one about God's love for us. And now, for an amazing story inspired by the book of whatever we were doing that week. And it was just, at the, it was really at this point when I saw this video, I'm like, here I am in a kid's class, and it took that to kind of bring this back to me of just, <clears throat> wow, that's really true, you know, that this is one story. And then you have this zoomed out kind of timeline. And then each week we would just dive into a different part uh, to learn something for that week to apply. So I thought, where was this when I was in Sunday school? We didn't have stuff like this. We didn't have these cool videos and things. Um, so I was really like, wow, this is great for our kids. So I think this kind of started my uh, obsession. <coughs> with uh, the continuous story. Um, I don't know if you've read this one. This one, I, you know, I don't know how, it's fun to read at least once. You know, it's, the, it's seeing the Bible as a novel. And so I, I read this book one time and it was just, it really just kept that timeline order. Because sometimes you get bogged down in how many shekels of gold were needed. Um, and you're like, you know, I don't necessarily need that detail all the time. Um, so this kind of pulls out some of that detail, paraphrases that kind of stuff, but just keeps the main storyline going. So the back of the book here says, God goes to great lengths to rescue lost and hurting people. That's what the story is all about, the story of the Bible, God's great love affair with humanity. The story sweeps you into the unfolding progression of Bible characters and events from Genesis to Revelation. It allows the stories, poems, and teaching of the Bible to read like a novel. And in like any good story, the story is filled with intrigue, drama, conflict, romance, and redemption. And this story is true. So if we can be as excited as the back cover promises that this is an amazing story and we want to read it and share it. Okay. Yes? For, for that, it, it, does, it, um, does it tell where you are in the Bible as you go through or is it? Um, there is some little timeline things I think on the main pages. I was, I was going back and looking at that. They definitely have like references in the back, you know, that will show you every, every detail. And then there's kind of italic, it'll kind of say, the next few paragraphs have been paraphrased just to say there were 100 shekels of gold. You know, that's ultimately what you need to know. Um, but yeah, I think at the, the, the opening chapter to each session kind of has like a little more of a timeline of where you are. Um, but there is in the back a full accounting of where you are. So yeah, it definitely doesn't replace your Bible, but it's a, it's a fun read. And it's usually like five bucks too, you know, when you go on the, the Christian website. It's like it's a very inexpensive resource. Um, so that was a nice, easy read, but then I just couldn't get enough, so I needed the 875-page Harmony of the Gospels. That's where I want to dive in next, because I'm like, we have four Gospels. They essentially are saying the same thing, but they say it in a slightly different way. Um, so I love this one. It's, it looks scary, but it's really a great read, because this does the same thing. It puts all four in order of their stories and kind of shows the connection um, in that same timeline order. Um, I, I don't have the other one. I think I already packed it, put it in the attic. But my family loved this next one, um, which is the Action Bible. You know, so if you're looking for something for your kids, um, that's another good continuous story. It's fun for parents, too. So a little bit more of a graphic novel uh, format for kids to give them that continuous story. And then this last one is where I, I found our cool Bible framework. Um, it's... It's actually a kid's book. <laughs> so um, last summer I went to the Creation Museum. I, you were like, oh, she's already done a talk on the Creation Museum. I had one about just creation in self is so much to dig into. Um, but um, Ken Ham um, is part of that group. Um, and so he put together this great resource. And this is also a kid's resource. It's 52 stories, kind of those 52 highlight stories. Um, but what's different about this one is that he kind of traces God's plan of salvation throughout and kind of looking at the Messiah throughout. Um, and so not just thinking the Old Testament's just the Israelites and the way they were doing things, but how does that apply to our lives? So I thought this was a, a great resource. So what's the age group for that book? What's the age for this one? I don't know. Like, my kids were like, that's too young for me, Mom. And they're 12 and 14. They're like, okay. they were like, we're not going to read that. That's like a kid's book. <laughs> so they felt it was a kid's book. Um, but what I loved is right at the beginning, this is their table of contents. And of course, I had to cut it out, put it on cardstock, tape it together. 
I normally teach the kids class. Thanks for letting me teach the adult class today. <laughs> um, but this is the Bible framework. So they take those 52 stories. They put them within 12 C's. I couldn't be more excited than to have 12 C letter words uh, for our Bible framework today. And that's what's on the handout. So if you didn't get the handout, there is one back there um, that will walk us through these 12 C's. Um, so that was from, from Ken Ham. Um, and we're going to follow that, or, or, and, and Dale Mason um, from the, the Creation Museum. So, speaking of that handout, um, it's optional for you, but if you like to stay focused or have something to refer to when you get home, uh, we're going to do part one today, and this is a two-part series, so we'll do the backside uh, next week. So, along the top of our handout, just some um, visual aids, so that will be that line at the top, that will be our C letter. Uh, so we have these 12 C themes. Um, so I'll reveal those to you as we go along. Um, and then just a quick summary of what was involved in that theme. So kind of the big picture statement and then a summary. And then we'll just look at some key verses that go with that. Um, and so then this way we'll just kind of build along this framework um, piece by piece, pull out some key verses um, that you can use as you look through the framework. Um, this last row here is a door. Um, so when I was at the Creation Museum, they had this really great little, they had all these little pamphlets, I like them. Um, so doors of the Bible. Um, and so they just had this theme of um, the door of salvation. So Revelation 3.30, Jesus stands at the door and knocks. You know, we have all these kind of references in the Bible of somebody knocking and us entering in and going through the door. So we want to kind of go ahead and trace these themes of the Bible and then really focus on God's plan of salvation throughout the whole Bible, not just the New Testament, and look at some specific examples of those who entered in. All right. So we're ready to dive in to some C's. And did we get rid of all these Bibles back no, here? Um, so I have six Bibles and we have six people. <laughs> um, how convenient <laughs> so at least take if you want to use your own bible that's fine but uh, the sticky notes can kind of hold your place um, and so you'll see it's reader one reader two so you'll know uh, when your turn's coming up <laughs> we might need you Donna you <laughs> Figured, you know, kind of break it up so it's not just me. All right, so based on our little icon there, any guesses what our first C is? Creation. <laughs> Creation. So they're not rocket science, right? They are like, <laughs> they're stuff that's pretty easy to remember. Um, so obviously our story of the Bible starts with creation. Um, and don't let all the big bang and evolution stuff really minimize what happened here. God wanted to be in relationship with his creation in a beautiful paradise, the Garden of Eden. But you know what he did first? He whipped up an amazing universe that's bigger than we can even comprehend. And then he narrowed in on the earth where he would spend time with man in a beautiful garden full of animals and beauty. And it's not so much different than us as parents, right? We hear we're expecting a child and we're like, we've got to get to Home Depot. We've got to go get the paint. We've got to make a cute room. And we want to spend time with our child in that room that we've created for them. So that was how God was feeling at the beginning of the time, putting in touch, um, putting in all those last-minute touches before he created man and woman. And so this was the original plan, that he wanted to be with his creation and walk with them. So obviously a key player here is God, which we find right in the beginning with Genesis 1-1. So who was my first reader? If you want to read Genesis 1-1. In the beginning, when God created the heavens and the earth, the earth was a formless void, and darkness covered the face of the deep, while the wind from God swept over the face of the waters. <laughs> um, so very, you know, we very much well know that verse. And so then John 1.1 1, 1 is our New Testament reference. We want to read that one. Two, four. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Great. Um, so I just love how the New Testament reinforces the Old Testament. 
letting us know that that Old Testament is still relevant to us today. And it's not, repla it's not replaced, but it's rather supplemented by the New Testament. So I just love that we had this 1-1 one, one verse in Genesis, and then we had this 1-1 one, one verse in John. So we can add to our key players, Jesus, that the New Testament verse was referring to. But I think there were three, right? So we have one more verse, Genesis 1-2. Now the earth was formless and empty, darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. So we can add the Holy Spirit to our, our key players here. Once again, we're building up your Jeopardy you know, lingo here. So we have all of our key players, our key Bible references uh, for this important period of time. So one final question. Who was the door of salvation open to at this point? What would you think? We have this door of salvation. Who's, who can walk through the door of salvation at this point? Anybody that was around, right? <laughs> Pretty much Adam and Eve, right? Uh, doors wide open. God's plan is that he wants to be in relationship with what he's created. Um, he's created Adam and Eve, and he has this fellowship with them. However, things don't always go on in paradise like they should. Um, so what happened next? Any guesses to our next C, next major event in the Bible that we can make into a C? We had sin, we're like, sin, corruption. Um, so screech on the record, inevitably, corruption happens. Uh, we well know the story of Adam and Eve and that sneaky serpent who tempted them. So man and woman give in to temptation, sin enters the world, and requires separation from God. And God had set parameters uh, for the Garden of Eden. Um, they could do anything except for eat from that one tree. And sometimes we're like, well, why did he make up that rule? Uh, that just seems kind of random. Um, and so the serpent really fed into that. They're like, Eve, why is God withholding this from you? I thought he wanted what was best for you. Why won't he let you do this? I like um, Pastor Tom in his opening sermon for this series. He talked about the lies of Satan as we saw them in the temptation of Christ. And he talked about putting God to the test. It's like, my sense of entitlement, why can't I have what I want? Why is God holding back? Why can't I eat from this tree? Doesn't he want what's best for me? And so the serpent really had a foothold. Looking back now, of course, we know that God wanted to protect them from knowing about evil. This was his test to see if they would obey him. And we know that once you've seen something, you can't go back to not seeing it, going back to that innocence. I don't know if you've ever you know, been at your friend's house like I was when I was young, and they had poltergeist on, and I was just so curious. My parents had said, no horror movies, and I'm like, why? Why can't I watch horror movies? Now I know. <laughs> I don't think I've watched one since. <laughs> so my parents knew what was best for me. God knew what was best for them, um, but they made this choice of disobedience. He wanted us to willingly choose him and not be robot followers. So he gave Adam and Eve and us the freedom to choose obedience. Um, but they listened to the serpent, sin entered the world, and it led to death. They didn't die immediately, but their course for death was set. Um, it was, however, an immediate death for the animal that God had to use to clothe them, um, to cover their nakedness, to cover their sin. And that kind of sets up that precedence that we see in the Old Testament, that an unblemished animal um, needs to die for our sin, and setting up that future that there must be some way to ultimately resolve this sin. So we have our key players, Adam and Eve and the serpent, and then we have some verses about this time period. So who's my second reader? We can read Genesis 3.6. So when the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye and also to the eye, She took some and ate it. She also gave some to her husband, who was with her, and he ate it. Okay. And then we have a New Testament reference as well. So once again, a New Testament reinforcing our, what we learn in the Old Testament to say that it's still relevant today. So Romans 5.12. Yes. Therefore, just as sin entered the world through one man, and that through sin, and in this way, death came to all men, because all sinned. Right. 
So sin has entered the world. We've lost this idyllic paradise we were in. And really, the open door has temporarily slammed shut, right? They get kicked out of the Garden of Eden. There are angels put there. They're not to return. So no going back now and a hard life ahead. But, so I don't know about you, but that's a little jolting to me. I was like, whoa. This happened on page five in my Bible. I don't know what, what, what page on your Bible, but there's a lot of pages in my Bible. In page five, already, sin has entered the world. They're kicked out of the Garden of Eden. It's pretty traumatic. So I was like, does this follow typical, typical literary structure? I had, to, I had to know. So I found this cool, simple map on a website called A Bridge to God's Word. And you can see here on the left that usually it starts off with some scene setting which we did see some of that in the Garden of Eden, of God, we're kind of setting the scene of what's about to happen. But kind of that line there looks a little longer than what I experienced on page five. So sometimes it, there's a little more build, we didn't have a lot of build. But you can see right here, we have this inciting moment right here. Things are kind of going along smoothly and then this big event happens. The author of this website defines it as the conflict that sets the story in motion. Something happens which causes a problem that the rest of the story must resolve. And certainly, the sin of Adam and Eve created a really big problem. So then we go into this rising action. And pretty much, the author says, it's the entire Old Testament. And to me, that was like 844 pages. So you've got a good chunk of some rising action where the author says here, various incidents happen which drive the story and build tension as the reader wonders how things will be resolved. So I would say there's lots of incidents in the Old Testament where we see a re try to re resolve this conflict. In fact, the next six C's that we have in our list are all ways that have been attempted to resolve this sin problem. We could almost just collapse them down just to say six C's for conflict. There's just a lot of conflict and a lot of uh, things going on and we're not able to make any resolution. So you're probably like, why can't we just skip over that and just get right into, we just get right here. I don't know if we could appreciate it if we didn't really dig into to what's going on in those other six C's. So we're going to take the time to explore that. But before we can get on to those other C's, we're still kind of in this inciting moment or we're right at the beginning of this rising action. That corruption really just takes hold, right? We see Cain kill his brother Abel. And then it just gets increasingly worse and worse. Genesis 6, 5 says, The Lord saw how great man's wickedness on the earth had become, and that every inclination of the thoughts of his heart was evil all the time. All right. So we got six of these that we're going to try to figure out the rising action of how did man try to resolve this. So any guesses to our first C based on our little, little icon? just tying it to the sea sometimes. You're like, flood, flood. Sea words for flood. <laughs> what is it? Cleansing. Cleansing. Any? Um, covenant. Covenant. That but one will come like, up. Because <laughs> yeah. like, that is a time of covenant, but it looks like covenants two seas yeah. later. <laughs> and the Lord does make a lot of different covenants as well. So, um, catastrophe. <laughs> so we did throw some, you know, tricky ones in here. It couldn't just be flood, you know. So, um, so catastrophe hits. We're going to wipe out and start over. I call this one fondly the worst case scenario option. Um, so Genesis 6, 6 to 7, the Lord was grieved that he had made man on earth and his heart was filled with pain. He said, I'm going to wipe out mankind and I'm and that includes, you know, the men, the animals. I'm grieved, and I'm going to wipe them out. But in 6, 8, he says, But there was one righteous man, Noah, who found favor in the eyes of the Lord. And it's important that he saved one remnant from his original creation. In Genesis 3, 15, God says to the serpent, And I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head, and you will strike his heel. So it's from Eve's offspring that ultimately this resolution to the problem of sin will come. So Genesis is very focused on following the genealogy. They're like, we've got Eve, we've got to follow her offspring. Somebody from Eve is going to be this ultimate resolution for this problem of sin. So usually it's the first son that will carry on the family line. Um, but because of Cain's sin and the death of Abel, 
we're going to follow Seth's line to Noah. And Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. So let's get back on track here with our little list. So obviously some of our key players here are Noah and his family. And the flood story is captured in Genesis chapters 6 through 9. So who's my reader 3? Um, so if you want to read the, the Genesis verse. Genesis 7.23, he blotted out every living thing that was on the face of the ground, man and animals and creeping things and birds of the heavens. They were blotted out from the earth. Only Noah was left and those who were with him in the ark. And then you can read the New Testament reference, 2 Peter 3.6, to see how we reinforce that. And that by means of these, the world that then existed was deluged with water and perished. Great. And Peter then goes on to compare it to the second coming and how very like the time of Noah that it would be, um, but that it wouldn't be destroyed by water, but instead by fire. So let's follow our trail through the Bible of who was welcome to enter into the door at this time. Was it just Noah? What do you think? Was the plan of salvation just for, for Noah at this point? <laughs> um, in this um, Doors of the Bible, this is what you can see this looks like an ark door. It says um, there was just one door to get in. Um, and so that's where they get kind of this door theme. John 10, 9, Jesus says, I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved. So those who are outside the door will perish, but those who enter in are rescued. So I just want to explore a little bit more about... Has anybody seen... Uh, Evan Almighty. <laughs> it's not exactly historically accurate, but it's a real fun kind of parody of uh, Noah's Ark. Um, and so you can start to, I love this scene where he's, he's finally convinced, so this is Steve Carroll, so he's finally convinced he needs to build the Ark. Um, and you can just start to see all these curious people start to kind of gather. And I'm thinking, it probably could have been like that in his time, right? He's building this really enormous thing. I'm sure people walked by and said, Noah, what are you doing there? Um, and so he would have to explain God's plan. And I'm sure that if during that time somebody said, you know what, Noah, I believe you, and he picked up a hammer to help, I believe God would have saved him, you know? But I believe that most of them were like what we see in Evan Almighty. They're sitting there making fun of him. This newscaster here calls him Evan, the weirdo, the beardo, and some of them were like, he's loco, and you can see people just laughing and ma making fun of him, like, why are you doing this? This is crazy. Um, the Dale Mason actually says that his example is just really the greatest one in the Bible of perseverance. He said it was probably about 120 years <laughs> that it took him to build this with his sons, um, and just all during that time, people gathering and just making fun of him. Um, that Second Peter reference referenced the scoffers of Noah's time. Um, so we do see some allusions to there were people just making fun of him. But I would be sure that God wanted people to be saved. If they had repented and turned to him, they probably could have come into the ark. Um, but they had just evil and wickedness in their hearts. So that was one not so great way to resolve this problem of sin. That was God's taking action. Um, another way to resolve it is man took some action. We have confusion. Man wanted to find their own way to heaven. And it, so they try to reach heaven via the Tower of Babel. Um, so the Gospel Coalition points out that why God wasn't pleased with this. So it says, to make a name for oneself is to place oneself ahead of God. By constructing a tower that reaches to the heavens, the people look to move beyond the earth where God has placed them into the realm where God is present. So God came, saw their efforts to reach the heavens on their own without acknowledging God. So God came down and confused their languages. He obviously did that to stop them from doing what they were doing and probably a, a bit of punishment as well. So we find the story of Babel in Genesis 11. So where's my next reader for Genesis 11? Genesis 11. 7 to 8. Come, let us go down and there confuse their language so that they may not understand one another's speech. So the Lord dispersed them from there over the face of the earth, of all the earth. 
and they left off building the city. Okay, and we'll take a pause before the New Testament one. So it's just a, a short passage, but it really explains how we go from Adam and Eve and Noah and their small families to people dispersing and going throughout the earth, um, and they developed their own cultures and languages because um, they had to find each other and move off. Just uh, an interesting thing here. So when I went to the Creation Museum, nearby is the Ark Encounter, so the big life-size Noah's Ark boat. Has anybody else been out there? It's totally worth it. I feel like it changed my life. <laughs> you know, really just helped me see the Bible in a different way and really how it is really important to us today. It's in Kentucky, so I'm like, it's never by anything that I drove by. So I'm like, you really have to be intentional about getting there. Um, but they're at least close together, the, the Creation Museum and the Ark Encounter. But they have all these great exhibits, and I, I bought a book that has a picture of all the exhibits, and so this was one of the exhibits. And it was just, you know, kind of also showing that from a secular perspective, you can also see some truth to the Bible. So not only do we believe the Bible is true, but from a secular perspective, um, he just shows all these examples of different towers that were built, you know, in this early period. And he's like, they probably took this knowledge of their uh, tower building skills and they dispersed over different lands. And you can see those tower efforts continue. So I thought that was interesting. And then they also traced flood stories. There are many cultures that have a story of a, a great flood. So it doesn't mirror exactly ours. Certainly the oral tradition, things probably got changed a bit. But you can see that all these people come from a common ancestor, have this common history, and have this common flood story. So I just thought these were just kind of interesting views from the, the secular point, um, kind of reinforcing these two, two stories we looked at. So it's a challenge to find an exact like, Tower of Babel reference in the New Testament, um, but there was one author that compared it to Pentecost. Um, so if you want to um, read the Acts passage, um, I broke it into two cause, so we don't have to get into all those names. <laughs> There's a lot of hard to pronounce names. We're just going to skip over that section. <laughs> and at this song, the multitude came together and they were be wild because each one was hearing them speaking in their own language and they were amazed and astonished saying, are not all those who are speaking Galilean? And how is this that you hear? each of us in his own native language. So, so can I skip the names? <laughs> skip the names and then... <laughs> Hear them telling in our own, own tongues in the mighty work of God. And all were amazed and uh, perplexed, saying to one another, what does this mean? But others mocking say, said they are filled with new wine. All right, so we can see here that um, the author of Bible to Life says that in a very real sense, the unity lost at Babel was restored on the day of Pentecost when Jews from many different nations heard Galileans speaking their tongue. So at Babel, we see a confusion of languages and people have to separate from one another. But at Pentecost, we hear the bringing back together of people. Everybody heard what they needed to hear and that brought them together. So I just thought that was kind of a really cool parallel of... of these languages that we hear at Babel and at Pentecost. Um, so who's our um, door of salvation open to at this point? It wasn't really clear. It really kind of feels like a punishment time period, kind of back at the Garden of Eden. It kind of feels like it's a little bit closed for now, um, but that God still wants to be in relationship. And I think as he was carving out these different groups of people, he was carving out uh, this group of people that he was going to be his chosen people. So you're probably like, I thought we were going to talk about the genealogy. <laughs> you promised. <laughs> Matthew doesn't talk about anybody before Abraham. Um, so we're finally just going to connect back up here. But Luke does. Luke also has a genealogy. Uh, so we can see some of these names appear here. So we, obviously, this one kind of goes in reverse of what Matthew's goes top down. This one goes bottom up. So we have God there at the beginning of time. Um, obviously, he had Adam, and that we had that corruption appear during that time period. Um, we trace the line of Noah through Seth. 
We have Noah up here. We have a few other names here. There weren't some clear stories right in the Bible, but we recognize some of those names, and we have other sources that tell us about those. And then Noah's son Shem is through the line of Jesus that we're going to trace, and then we're going to get into Abraham. So then Luke kind of fills in this part for us. I think Matthew was just like, you know what? The important thing is that he came from Abraham. He came from David. That's what I'm going to trace. There are so many genealogies that trace Adam back to Adam, Abraham back to Adam. So like, I'm not going to get into that. I'll let Luke take care of that. Um, so he starts over here with Abraham. And that's where we're going to pick up in our genealogy here. And then this first paragraph, the next thing we're going to do is trace Abraham down to David. So here's the covenant that you were <laughs> anticipating. It's got to be one of these. It's got to be covenant. <laughs> um, so our next C is covenant, in particular our covenant with Abraham. And this is introduced the error of the patriarchs, starting first with God's promise to make Abraham into a great nation. So we see this in Genesis 12. Who is my reader 5? Who has Genesis 12? I will make of you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great, so that you will be, be a blessing. I will bless those who be bless you, and him who dishonors you I will curse. And in you all the families of, families of the earth shall be blessed. Okay. And as you're getting your way to Matthew, just, you know, so obviously with Abraham, you know, we have his son Isaac becomes the father of Jacob, and then we come into these 12 sons who become the 12 tribes of Israel. So we enter this period of, you know, we have this kind of family tree, patriarchal uh, leadership time period. So go ahead with a Matthew reference. Chapter 3. And <clears throat> do not presume to say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father, for I tell you, God is able to from these stones to raise up children for Abraham. Right. So we see in Matthew that we're going to issue in a new covenant that it doesn't matter if you're a Jew, um, that God can still kind of raise up the sons of, of Abraham. Um, but we do see during this covenant period that it is very important that you're part of this family tree. So... As far as the door of salvation, uh, certainly we see it's open to Abraham and the chosen people of God. But in Matthew's genealogy, we do see a few people who are not Jews. Um, and so one of these, the first one of these is Tamar. Um, and I know periodically we'll reference Tamar's story, and I'm like, I forget Tamar's story. So I had to go back and, and dig through. Um, and so she had married one of Judah's sons. Um, and I didn't realize that at that time, Judah, really, his sons, him, they were really following this wicked path, um, intermarrying with the Canaanites. Um, and so God just keeps killing his sons for their evil wickedness. So Tamar is left a widow, um, and so she's entitled to have a kinsman redeemer. And we know that there were such exciting things for Ruth and Boaz, with the whole kinsman redeemer, but Tamar really wasn't getting her what was due her. Uh, so she had to resort to deceit to find her redeemer in Judah. And so finally, Judah comes to re realize his mistake. And she said, and at some one point, he says, Tamar is more righteous than I. And it becomes a turning point in his life. And he really turns away from this uh, life of sin and turns away, turns towards God. So we see Tamar listed in the genealogy, really as a remembrance of what was needed to get Judah to, to turn to God. It wasn't hidden. It wasn't taken out of the genealogy. They could have just said Judah's name, but they put Tamar's name in. This genealogy is made up of imperfect people, um, and it's always there as a constant reminder to us. So I just think it's amazing how God changed the heart of Judah, and then he became part of that important genealogy for the line of Jesus. So at the end of Genesis, we still see uh, the people of God in Egypt and Joseph has a prophecy that he's about to die, but God will send someone to take you up out of this land to the land that was promised. So any ideas what our last C is for today? Commandments. 
Commandments, yes. <laughs> yes. She's like, it looks like a little Ten Commandments. It looks like <laughs> <Tablets>. <laughs> um, I know you're probably thinking Exodus. We're like, where are we going to go for the sea? So here our story switches over to Moses. Um, and we're finally in Exodus. All those other stories were in Genesis. So Genesis is really jam-packed, very interesting. Um, and I think those Bible in a Year plans start to go downhill after that point. <laughs> Uh, so we look over the genealogy, and we're like, where's Moses? He's not in the genealogy. He's an important guy. Like, where, why isn't he in the line of Jesus? So I had to go find him, uh, the good genealogist that I am. Um, <laughs> I could have started with this, but I, I held back. Um, so these are the, the patriarchs. So we kind of recognize some of these names, right? We got Noah, Shem, Abraham, Isaac, Isaac's sons. Uh, Jacob, and then the 12 tribes of Israel. So we find Moses in here. So he was actually part of the tribe of Levi, uh, our line of priests. Um, so we kind of see this switch, and this is where that continuous story gets harder to follow, because now we're not kind of following the, the Jesus genealogy. We're introducing some other characters here. And then we can see that you know, David is in the line of Judah, and that's the one that leads to Christ. So Moses still kind of a near kin. He's not like way down here, um, but he is. That's where he falls in our, our genealogy. Um, just pointing out some other names that will come up. So we have Joshua here um, as a son of Ephraim, son of Joseph, and then Saul comes from the tribe of Benjamin. So we'll see those characters come up again here soon. And then the Moabs, they were way down here, <laughs> uh, Moabites, and so we know that Ruth was a Moabite. So we can see, really, if you're not in here, you were kind of outside uh, of the plan. But we see that God does include Ruth in his plan of salvation. Anyway, back to our classwork assignment. So Moses brings God's people out of Egypt. They get the law, and the law is overseen by the judges. Um, and so we find this in our key verse for our last reader, Deuteronomy 4, 13 to 14. And he declared to you this covenant which he commanded you to perform, that is the Ten Commandments. Is that, do I have the right verses? Uh, two verses, yep. Right? Uh, sorry. And the Lord commanded me at that time to teach you statutes and rules that you might do them in the land that you are going over to possess. Okay. So we go from this, you know, leadership of the patriarchs to now we have this leadership of Moses in the, the role of really like a judge. So God gives the law and Moses helps um, oversee the law. Um, and I like um, Hicks, an author, um, says that God gave the Ten Commandments in a really powerful way, like big booming voice, thunder, like these were important, please do not forget these. So... Those were things that we still believe today. You know, this was a really important message, these Ten Commandments. Um, but then there were lots of like little civil and ceremonial laws, and we don't follow those to the letter of the law today, but we certainly follow the spirit of that law, um, and a lot of those roll up into our Ten Commandments. And so then our New Testament verse, Matthew 5, 17 to 18. Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them. So God, Jesus came to fulfill that law, um, but he didn't completely abolish it. He says, the Ten Commandments say, don't murder. You're like, ooh, that's an easy one. I'm not going to do that. But he says, if you have anger in your heart, it's like you've murdered. You're like, whoa, <laughs> why'd you have to go there? You know. So now we really still have to focus on those Ten Commandments. And Jesus brought that down to our level of just kind of the state of your heart and how... Um, not just following the individual laws, but the, really the state of your heart. In Jeremiah 31, 33, it says, God would make a new covenant with us, one that would supersede this one made with Moses, that puts the law in our heart and in our minds so that we know it, want to do it, which we'll talk more about when we get into the New Testament section. So we've definitely seen you know, Moses as a key character during this time. Um, so then we're entering in this period of just judges. So this is actually a really a big chunk of things. We've got Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. 
Um, then we hear Joshua's story. So Moses starts off as our first judge, hands it over to Joshua. And then we actually do enter into a period of the, the judges. And so I would just say that, you know, who is the door open to at this point? Those of faith. But we see a few more people, you know, pop up in the genealogy. We see Rahab and Ruth also show up in the genealogy, non-Jews, um, but called by God um, into faith with him. So we have these judges, Joshua. So I'm not going to dive too much into this slide here, but just um, dur during one of our Bible studies, we did dive into Judges and Ruth. Uh, so it's really not a, a pretty time and pe period. Judges 17.6 says, In those days there was no king in Israel. Everyone did what was right in his own eyes. Um, and he just, like this one author here, Tim Mackey, he just basically, rinse, wash, repeat the whole book of Judges. We do evil. God gives them over to their oppressors. They cry out for help. God raises a savior. And then there's peace for a little bit until it happens again. <laughs> so... Um, so it's just a really dark time here. You know, while they were in the wilderness together, they were all together. There weren't as many temptations, although they still found a way. Um, but once they moved into the promised land and started mingling in um, with the pagan culture, they just succumbed to it and resorted into those uh, sinful natures. So um, this author here, Mackey, says, it becomes clear these stories are showing that the moral corruption within Israel is going to be solved by one thing alone. Israel needs a good king. And at first they think it's an earthly king they need, but we'll see even further that we need this heavenly king to bring ultimate resolution. Whew. So we're still here. <laughs> we're going to start here next week. <laughs> it's a long line, um, but we will eventually get there. Um, but that just shows you a little bit of, of where we are. So let's just wrap up with the, the genealogy. So... Pretty much we worked in this left section, the Abraham to David. Uh, we'll dive further into this part of the genealogy next week. So we saw here that we had um, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Judah. And then we had um, Judah was one of the 12 tribes, 12 sons. So Judah, and they referenced the 12 tribes there. We talked about Tamar. She made the genealogy unusual for not only a woman, but also a Canaanite to be in the genealogy. Then there's a section here in the middle that I couldn't find a lot about. They do reference um, in Numbers 1-7 that Moses appoints Nashon as the leader of his tribe of Judah. So, you know, he did at least make a, a call out in Numbers. Um, I think you know the story of Rahab who helped Joshua and his spies as they were scoping out um, Jericho, and then certainly the story of Ruth and Boaz. And hopefully you got to see the play um, that the, um, our own Ben and Kristen were in about the true kinsman redeemer. And then we can see our path to David. And so that's where we'll pick up next week is with David. Um, but we can see kind of a little spotty uh, family tree there. It's not perfect. You would think just to see superheroes and perfect people, um, but that's not how it works in God's kingdom. So we're happy. The genealogy shows that God takes the imperfect as well. So that's our first half of our timeline. Hopefully you've filled out the first half of your sheet. Take your Bible pen with you. It's got a verse on it. Um, if you don't like your verse, you can pick a different one. Um, <laughs> but we'll see you back next week. Thank you, Kim, so Thank much. you. This is awesome. And but before we leave, could you uh, two things? So, have you transitioned? You and your family transitioned from those wonderful books that you introduced us to, and into like diving into the text? I know you said you read Matthew, but like, has have you transitioned to doing that as a as a family or individuals? And then uh, I would love for you to pray for us that we would have a hunger mm -hmm. uh, to to run to God's word and to try to understand the story better. Yeah. No, I love, like, the Bible app for my kids because they're so into technology. So, like, them, so I try to once in a while have them use an old-fashioned Bible. But um, mm -hmm. the Bible app, you know, to, to read the actual, like, my son accepted the challenge to read Matthew, you know. So he died. So I think it's helpful when the church kind of gives us a challenge to, to go to as a family. Um, but that, and then those, there's also those devotion plans in the app. So that's what's working for our family is technology. <laughs> so, but... 
But, and, and then any questions before we, we wrap up? So I, I, sometimes I'm like, oh, this is too basic a topic. But for me, I'm like, I've been a Christian for 50 years. And I'm like, this is still exciting to me. So just I think it's more taking these puzzle pieces and putting the puzzle together. And it's really just seeing this big picture and like, wow, that is so amazing that God had this plan and that the Bible is put in a way that we can trace that plan all the way back to Genesis. So let's go ahead and pray. Dear Jesus, thank you so much for revealing your word to us. Uh, thank you that this word has come down from generation to generation. It's been preserved. It's been found in amazing places and caves and dig sites, and that we just keep discovering that this is your word um, and that it has this powerful story to tell us. Dear Lord, let's take this word into our lives as we go into our week. And dear Lord, please help us to just start memorizing scripture, having it being part of us, um, and have it ready at hand when we need it in our daily lives. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Amen. <laughs>